Welcome to another edition of Theology Thursdays. There was a subject I wanted to tackle today, and in the providence of God, it is a very appropriate subject to look at today, and that is the issue of social justice. Now, unfortunately, the term social justice, or the phrase social justice, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But I don't want to get off on trying to define it and, and, and think of it primarily in like political terms. I want us to think of it primarily in biblical terms and what it means for Christians when it comes to issues that are not directly spiritual issues, but really about how we live around one another. The Old Testament is packed full of statements about social justice issues, about caring for one another, about our faith being lived out in our daily lives as we relate to other people. There are four primary texts, uh, Isaiah 1, Amos 5, Hosea 6, and then the most famous probably is Micah 6. Those four, all from prophets who were contemporary with each other in the 8th century B.C., the 700s B.C., all of them essentially say the same thing. God says, I'm not interested in your sacrifices. In fact, I couldn't care less if you didn't sacrifice. I don't even want you to pray. I I'm tired of your religious ritual. What I'm looking for is how you treat others. That's what real religion looks like. So, for example, in Micah 6, that's so famous, 6-8, what does he require of you, O oh man, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? That's what God's looking for. He says, man, you could take 10,000 animals and sacrifice them, and they don't mean anything to me. This is really what God is looking for. One that I want to read is the one that was Martin Luther King's favorite when it comes to social justice. It's from Amos chapter 5, and I just want to... There's a whole lot here. We'll pick up in verse uh, 21 of Amos chapter 5. This is God speaking. And he says, I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. So basically what he's saying is, I don't even hear the music in your service. You're not worshiping me. I don't hear that. Just stop. Just stop. But this is what God is looking for. He says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So I want to say um, just a couple things about social justice off of this text and what we find in the Bible and how that should relate to us in our lives today. The Amos 5, uh, 24 he says, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Those of us who live in the desert understand this. There are two kinds of rivers. There is the Mississippi River, the Colorado River. They, they run all the time. Then out here, we have rivers like the Agua Fria. And you drive across it, and it's just a giant ditch. There's no water in it. Uh, we have a number of rivers that are like that. They're just a big ditch, what we call a wash. What in the Middle East, they call a wadi. So in Amos 5.24, what he's saying is, I don't want you to be like a wadi that just fills up with water when it rains, but is dry the other 362 days out of the year. He says, instead, I want your justice to be like the Colorado River, the Mississippi River, the Ohio River, the Tennessee River, whatever river it is, that flows steadily. I know it goes up and down, but there's a steady consistency to it. The problem with these people was they went to the temple once a week, and they thought that was good enough. And they could live the rest of their lives the way they wanted to. You and I can't just show up at church on Sunday for a couple of hours and think, I'm good, uh, that's it, and I can live the rest of my life the way I want to. That's a Christianity, it's like a wash. It's a little bit of water in it for a brief period of time, but the rest of the time it's mostly dry. What God wants from you and me is a steadiness, a consistency in the way we live out our faith. So social justice is one of the ways, as a matter of fact, it's one of the primary ways in the Old Testament that this is done, is by living out our faith this way. This is the second half of the great commandments. The first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. 
And so social justice is living out, loving our neighbors ourselves. Now, in the Old Testament, it's very instructive for us the way that um, those that are taken advantage of, the poor, the needy, fall into essentially three classes. They are widows, orphans, and foreigners who are living in Israel. Now, the reason those three categories are selected, typically as representatives, is because in order to go to the city gate where court would be held, you had to be an adult male Israelite. So if you're a widow, you have no man to stand for you in the court. If you're an orphan, you have no adult to stand for you. And if you are a foreigner, you are not able to stand there because you're not an Israelite. In other words, widows, orphans, and foreigners could all be taken advantage of by people. So God is constantly watching out for them and telling us we need to do so. Now recognize that in our society, it's not exactly like that. Um, but there are still lots of people that folks take advantage of. There are people that try to scam the elderly, and they scam widows. I mean, that certainly is still viable. There are people that try to take advantage of other folks. There are people that abuse other people. And God says none of this is right. In other words, what the Bible teaches is that justice is supposed to be, well, like an ever-flowing stream. It's supposed to be consistent and even. You and I as Christians should be on the forefront of speaking for people that are marginalized, people that are taken advantage of, people that have no voice for themselves. This would include, uh, like the pro-life movement, we are speaking for the unborn because they do not have a voice to speak for themselves and there are those who want to brutalize them, kill them, take advantage of them, whatever words we want to use there, I mean, it is murder. There are people that, because of their language barriers or because of race or because of economic status, that, that, that there are people who take advantage of them. We don't believe in a multi-tiered society when it comes to justice. We believe that justice should be even. Why we, I say, we as Christians, and we should seek for this to happen. We should be on the forefront. So when we think of social justice, yes, it involves racial issues. Yes, it involves economic issues. But it involves a whole lot more than that. You and I believe that because everyone is created in the image of God, and everyone is valuable to God, we want to see everyone treated the same in terms of society. We don't believe in taking advantage of people. We don't believe that there are second-class people that can be used or abused or taken advantage of. In some ways, it's disappointing to me that as Christians, we're not on the front lines of domestic abuse issues where someone is abusing someone and can get away with it because of the, the way the home is structured. That we're not on the forefront of child trafficking human trafficking. Slavery is an abomination. In the Bible, it's an abomination. To sell a human being actually was illegal. Uh, most of the slavery in the Bible was because you owed somebody money and you were working it off. The Bible condemns what we oftentimes think of as slavery. Um, you are not allowed to <clears throat> sell one hum human being to another like you would cattle. Um, Exodus makes this very clear. And so, as Christians, we should be on the forefront of social justice I do realize some people have taken it to the extreme. For some people, this is Christianity, which that's not, neither one of those are true. Christianity is about my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It is a spiritual issue. That is number one for us. That is the first command, that we love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But we don't want to do that to the neglect of the second of the great commandments, to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so as Christians, we want to be on the forefront. And when we see... People in power abusing other people or taking advantage of other people or using other people for their own benefit in ways that are not good and positive and constructive. We as Christians should speak out against that because we want to love our neighbors. We want to show them the love of Jesus out of our concern for them. So, you know, with everything in the news um, about the way you know, some people have been abused, taken advantage of, and I know there's rioting sometimes, and, and, and I can tell you looting is not a proper response for a Christian when we see social injustice being done. But we as Christians should be on the forefront of these kind of issues because we do love other people, and the love of Christ should compel us to want to see them treated equally and fairly and carefully. So I hope that your Christianity 
is not just to, hey, my relationship with Jesus and I can do it in my own home, in my own time, in my own way. But that your Christianity is one that the Bible shows us. That it's one that flows like an ever-running stream. That it is consistent day in and day out. That you have concern about your relationship with Jesus, but also your concern for fellow human beings and for justice and equity to be done. So God bless you. Hope you have another great Thursday, another great weekend. And if at all possible, we hope to see you Sunday at church. God bless you.